We've been looking at this series of response, of not just knowing, but how meeting Christ, having an encounter with Christ, whether it's our first initial encounter, or it's simply just re-encountering Him, or just continuing to walk in Christ, does shape us. That encounter and that relationship does change us. And it's reminding us that we are sent into this world to not stand there like this. We are sent out into the world to be the voice, the hands, the feet of Christ. To give testimony and witness to what Jesus has done in our lives. And the great love of God. And how it's changed us. How it's met us where we are, but it's changed us. Now this scripture comes from Mark's Gospel account. The first 20 chapters of chapter, or first 20 verses of chapter 5. And then it goes over the healing account of a man who was possessed by demons. They, Jesus and the disciples, had went across the lake to a region of Jericho. I'm sorry, I wrote this down because I'm not really good at that. Gerasenes? Mike, help me out here. Gerasenes, does that sound right? When I don't know, I see fast and over here. There it is. <laughs> I had to look how to say it, um, but I looked up on YouTube several times how to say this, and this is the best one that I found. So uh, he wanted Jesus and the disciples went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes, verse two. And when Jesus got out of the boat across the lake, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. And this man lived in the tombs in the cemetery, and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with chains wrapped around him could they hold him. For he had often been chained by his hands and his feet. But he tore the chains apart and he broke the iron from his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Verse 5. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out in a loud voice. And he would begin cutting himself and torturing himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and then he immediately fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted, this demon possessed man shouted from the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of God, the Most High? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. And when Jesus asked him, What is your name? Jesus said to the spirit. And the spirit's response, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of this area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a hillside nearby. And the demons begged Jesus, send us amongst the pigs to allow us to go into them. And Jesus gave them permission to do this. And the evil spirits came out of the man who went into the pigs. And the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep of the bank of the lake and were drowned. Verse 14. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man there with Jesus who had been possessed by legions of demons just sitting there, now dressed and right of mind. And they began to be afraid. Those who had seen it had told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs and the well and the drowning. When the people began to plead them with Jesus to leave their region, to go away, as Jesus was getting into the boat to leave, the man who had had possessions of demons in his body said, Beg Jesus, let me go with you. Jesus said, No, go to your family. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And how he has had mercy on you. So finally in verse 20. We know that the man went away and began to tell everyone in the ten cities. How much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. There's a lot going on in this section of scripture. And I want us to root ourselves in this moment when we, when we sang these songs for our praise time, that we had that song, The Days of Elijah, that reminds us that there's hope scattered all throughout Scripture. To remind that this isn't the end, whatever struggle or time we're going through, whatever dry bones we, we may be coming across. And I want us to get this picture of, of what's happening here, because 
When Jesus goes across the lake, remember, it's sort of a division line, right? I guess I would say it's sort of like the Maginot Bridge, right? You have your blessed people of God in God's country, right? <laughs> and then sometimes when you go across that body of water, you're then with the Gentiles, the heathens, right? The unclean. Right? My, my head know with this a little bit. And so what it is, is we have to understand that Jesus did go to the Gentiles, right? And there was that moment when it was always the same faithful people of God. But Jesus crossed the lake to go on this other side. And see something so beautiful about that. Because Jesus is willing to cross to the other side to come find us. To come call us when maybe we've gone across the lake. And we don't realize how far away we've gone. That Jesus is always ready and willing go across and come fetch us. So Jesus goes across the lake in this moment, and he, he finds himself in the cemetery. Now we might have a different idea of what a cemetery might be like, right? Burial grounds, because we see them, and they're, they're nicely maintained, right? Usually by the city, we have them taken care of, and there's adornments there, and it's, it's somewhat organized, and there's roads. But that wasn't what we're picturing here. And so it helps us see maybe how there could be some fright, how there could be sort of a situation going on here. Because this man that was possessed uh, by many demons, remember Jesus says, what's your name? And the response is legion, many. So he was possessed by many demons. There are many evil spirits within him. And so this man comes out naked, right? He comes out naked. He's got cuts and bruises all over him. And he's, he's just kind of a crazy madman that people would recognize don't go to this area unless you have to. Sometimes we have to go to the cemetery. But a cemetery here wasn't just a flat or hilled land. It was a whole bunch of caves, a series of caves and rock faces that were there. And so what happened is you could imagine that when you go in this place, that it would be kind of scary because there's these caves and these rock faces everywhere. And so what would happen is the people then wouldn't necessarily bury, bury uh, the remains of someone who passed on into the ground. They would take them into the cave for about a year or so. And after a certain type of nature would happen, right, it would kind of eat away some of the outsides, we'd be left with bones. And then you would go back on the anniversary ceremoniously of their passing. You would go retrieve their bones and bury, bury those. So it was a very sort of scary, stinky place to be. So there's this man there that greets them. And I'm not sure if the disciples know who he is because they crossed the lake to the other side. This wasn't their neighborhood. But this man comes out that is possessed by demons and he says this. He shouted at Jesus. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. How interesting is this that we see the spirit within this man causing, causing his, his mouth to share out and recognize Jesus. And sometimes it puts us in perspective when we hear a story like this. We remember James, the New Testament book of James that says, Everyone will acknowledge and bow down to the authority of God. Even the demons will shudder at the name of Jesus. And it's interesting when, when this man, they realize, who is this legion? Or he says, what's your name? And he says, legion, for we are many. So we sort of have pity on this man because there are many things that were attacking him. There are many things that were possessing in his body. And so when we see this, we can see the reason probably, I would assume, why the, the spirit responds with legion is because then, remember, the whole area was under Roman rule. And so if you knew a legion of soldiers were there, you'd have anywhere from two, three thousand, sometimes all the way up to six to seven thousand people within this legion. So we get a better understanding why the language might have been call us legion, because we are many, we're talking about lots of spirits, right? And they even has to go in like two, uh, an area of two thousand pigs. So that means there's many spirits to go there in this moment. And I want us to think about what happens in our spiritual battles here when it says, they didn't want Jesus to torture them. What? The demons, right? Right. The, the figures and, and possessions of, of hell were here on earth possessing this man. And they said, please, 
Don't make us leave this area. My dear friends, I know sometimes it can be difficult to talk about spiritual warfare because there's a lot of mystery. But you know, when we're moving in the right ways towards God, we're going to be assaulted. You know, when we're making our way closer to a redemptive life of grace in Christ, we are going to come under attack. Those old whispers of some of our temptations are going to be here every single morning, hoping that they can help claim a day apart from Christ. But we don't battle alone. But those same whispers, those same spiritual influences, they said to Jesus, don't send us away from here. Where would Jesus send them? Back to hell. Even the demons don't want to go back. That's how bad it is. Jesus granted their request to go into the pigs, and the pigs quickly drown themselves. Before we go beyond that, I want us to think of these times. Does it feel like sometimes something in our lives feels like it possesses us in a way? I'm not saying I have a demon in me. I'm not saying that you have a demon in you. Maybe. But do you ever feel filled with something that we know doesn't honor Christ? And we struggle and we wrestle against it. It just won't go away. And then we encounter Christ. Jesus pushes that voice back. Pushes that presence, wants to push it out of us. But we have to ask to be cleansed of that sin. And even then, the whole townspeople knew that this man who had suffered for so long, he was dangerous. They knew about him for so long that they could tell you to stay away from this man because he would hurt himself. Because he would hurt himself. That no one else could bound him. They tried so many different things and even chains couldn't hold him down. No one was strong enough in town to, to restrain him anymore. And so when the townspeople heard what happened, they came back to this place and they freaked out because they saw this man who was dangerous, right? Who was kind of crazy, who was mad, who was demon possessed. All of a sudden sitting there next to Jesus they probably heard about. He had clothes on. That wasn't naked anymore. And he was calm. He was carrying on as normal would. Certainly to see someone that's changed. And I would ask us to think about our own story a little bit. My dear friends, how many of us maybe, when we've made a change in our lives, whether we look different, our career is different, or maybe even, even our spiritual relationship, right, even our faith, when we graduate from high school, there's a certain thing about us, right? We look a certain way. Some of us were thinner, had more hair. We were identifiable in a certain way. Some of us didn't know what we wanted to do, now we're doing a different career. You know, all these things change, and what's noticeable? People notice the change, don't they? They notice that you look different. They notice maybe you behave a little bit different, especially if you are one of those uh, immature folks who, even though you graduated high school, didn't quite get it, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden you get it, people are like, oh, wow, this is amazing, look at you turn around. It's simple things like this that the people notice that something is different about this man. When people find out we are Christians, when people hear us claim the name of Christ, for whatever reason, when we've exposed Christ in our lives, in their presence, do they see someone who's changed? They've walked with us our whole lives, or a good portion of them. Do they ever get scared? Because they see something that's different, that's changed. And even if it's a good change, panic. Because I wonder if that change is contagious. If it'll rub off on them. They wonder what will happen if this person starts to tell me about how their lives have changed, maybe it's going to make me feel guilty or different. I would hope our behavior would be different 
then these people, if we found out that someone that was possessed of an evil spirit or was broken in sin and they were healed, I hope we wouldn't panic and say, get out of here, Jesus. you got no place here. Your place is on Sunday morning in a building for an hour. Don't go invading our lives. See, because the people heard these stories and they came wanting to know what was going on. They came expecting fear. Now remember, livelihood. These weren't just 2,000 pigs that poof, came about. These were somebody's livelihood. This was somebody's economy. This was somebody's life. Maybe even more. Right? That was a big amount of livestock. They all died. I would like to know where the bacon and the ham were. <laughs> Guys, Thanksgiving's coming up. Where is it? What's going to happen? These people said, Jesus, we can't have these changes. We don't want you messing with our economy. We don't want you messing with our money. We don't want you messing with our people or our environment or our culture. You need to get on your boat. Get out of here. And the person that was saved begged Jesus, can I come with you? See, everyone else that wasn't saved was shouting at Jesus. You get out of here. You take your disciples with you. We don't need you here with us because you've changed things. My friends, if Jesus, if we encounter Jesus fully with our hearts and surrender to Christ, Christ will change things. And it will scare people. And it will frighten people and they will panic. But when we are the ones that are changed, we just want to stay with Jesus, don't we? Now, I'm not saying it was a certain time since I've been here, but you ever had a moment where you're like, well, I could have stayed there a little bit longer. I could have stayed at camp or in a opportunity a little bit longer. I could have, we could have sung a few more songs this morning, couldn't we? We just want to stay here for a little bit longer. You know, I've heard someone uh, uh, that was on a praise team in the past said, I would love to just do this all the time because it fills me like no other thing. And I don't want to go back into this world full of brokenness and try to leave the flashlight, right? It's easy to stand under the dome lights, but to go out to the darkness of this world with a flashlight. This demon-possessed man that was cleansed, that was made new, that encountered Jesus, and was reborn, given a new chance at life, said, let me come on the boat with you. Jesus said, no, no, no. I need you to do something else. I need you to go home and tell people exactly what happened that day so that people will know God. It's right that we want to go with Jesus. But Jesus asked us to do what? In our bulletins, we've been looking at a Go series. We've been looking at today as Go and Share. Go and share our testimony. Our testimony. Here's the one thing. We can have all the theology in the world. We can have all the, the righteous moralities in all this world. And people can begin to argue. What science say about that? Well, I don't like this. Or I don't interpret things that way. You know the one thing that we have in our lives that no one can argue with? Our story. No one can hear Matt Osborne's story and tell me it's wrong. It's my story. My story is rooted in Christ. And you can't tell me I'm wrong because that story is mine. Do you have a story? Do you have a testimony that the world cannot argue because it's your truth? And if Jesus is part of that truth, then no one can take that away from you. When we celebrate what Jesus has done, because Jesus met me when I was like that man in the cemetery. Spending way too much time with the things of death. And they were scary. And Jesus called those things out of me. He said, Matt, I have no for you. But Jesus, let me stay at camp. Jesus, let me stay at this men's retreat. Let me do these things. And she said, uh -uh. I need you to go into this world and tell people what I've done. I want us to think about this for a moment before we continue on today. Transformation in our lives is the best witness and testimony that we will ever have. 
Are we willing to share our story? It might sound like others. Our story might even have some of us in it, right? Husband and wife, brother and sister, families. Maybe we, we had an encounter with Christ and we shared this one single thing, but it's still our story. And how many of you believe today that your whole story isn't written yet? That there's still some chapters there? That Jesus is an eternal life altering Son of God. Change the course of our lives. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God that we are asked to share with this world because we don't want to just know it and celebrate it here. But when we leave, right, at 10 o'clock, or maybe a little after 10 if Pastor goes a little bit longer, well, let's just say 11. We don't want to go from this place at 11 o'clock and, gee, we know Christ and that was good and then not share what's changed our lives and our story to offer that so someone else can have a story of their own. So that they will be able to claim Christ and you will be part of their story because we shared it unashamed, unafraid. Because Jesus shook us and changed things. And because of our love and our death for Christ, we just want to offer that to someone else so someone else can have the evil pushed out of them. So someone else can make better decisions. So someone else can know unending life. right? So someone's whole destiny can be changed because they encountered Christ. And their hearts are surrendered anew. And here, friends, this story is one of hope. This is one of renewal. This is one of life given.